Hello, and welcome to Discovering True Health, your weekly deep dive into health and wellness. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before I get started with today's show, please hit the subscribe button below. It helps us a lot, and you will stay up to date on all our upcoming shows. You can also check out additional information on our website, Instagram, and Facebook. All those links are below. So over half of all Americans, or 60%, suffer from at least one chronic disease, and that number is growing and expected to worsen over the next several decades among all age groups. And what's interesting is, is that today we have a one in three chance of contracting cancer compared to a one in 10 chance back in the 1970s. Here in the U.S., we spent at least $500 billion on researching cancer, the current second leading cause of death here in the U.S., yet cancer rates are higher than ever. And today as well, we are the most technologically and scientifically advanced than we've ever been and medicated more now than ever. And one would think with our advancements in science and technology, pharmaceuticals and healthcare, that these numbers would be drastically decreasing, not increasing. So today in Discovering True Health, we're going to be debunking some of the myths around big pharma, talking about solutions and what a better healthcare paradigm would look like and how we can all take back control over our own health and wellness. So my guest joining me today is Anthony Samaroff. He's a psychotherapist and an economic journalist. He's also author of Universal Basic Income, as well as an ebook called Seven Big Pharma Myths Debunked. And he is also currently writing a new book called Big Pharma, None Dare Call It Quackery, which I'm very much looking forward to reading. So thank you so much for joining me today, Anthony. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me, Christy. I'm so excited to be in your show. I've loved um, being in touch with you and uh, um, listening to your show as well. I think what you're doing is so fantastic. Um, so it's great to be included as a part of it and be on this uh, side of the listening apparatus. Absolutely. I'm really excited to have you on and I enjoyed reading your book. So I'm excited to uh, talk about some of the details. And just FYI, we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty on Anthony's side with video. So yeah. we're trying to be figuring that out as we go. <laughs> um, yeah, go figure. It would happen just when I had the uh, interview. So I'd just like to mention to everyone at home that if they like anything that we he they hear on the show, they can go to sevenpharmamyths.com. That's the number seven. And then pharma, P-H-A-R-M-A, or as sometimes I like to say it, P-harm-A. And then myths like Greek or Roman mythology, sevenpharmamyths.com. And you can download the ebook for free. It's also got the facility to throw me a few shekels if you felt so inclined um, as I don't get paid six figures, unlike pharma reps or um, psychiatrists who prescribe medicine. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's there for absolutely for free. And probably most of what we cover today will be in that book or in one of my articles, which you would get links to through downloading the book. So I just mentioned that up front. Beautiful. Thank you for mentioning that. And I'll post a link to that below too, so everybody can find it very easily. Um, now, as you mentioned, as I mentioned, you are a psychotherapist and an mm. academic journalist, and now you're doing some really great in-depth research and writing on health and the healthcare business. What was kind of the catalyst that started you down that path? And what are some of the notable things you learned along the way on your own health journey? Wow, those are a couple of like really huge questions. So a lot of things went into this. Um, the last few years of like COVID madness, where um, kind of everyone was locked in their houses, but no one said anything. No one in the government said anything about natural immunity, how to boost your immune system, how to avoid getting a disease in the first place, how to lower your risk of mortality from COVID or any other condition you had, like made me feel like this might be like maybe the most important issue. Having come from a background in writing about economics, I'd already written quite a lot about the economics of healthcare, but most of it was unpublished. Plus, as you said, I had my own health journey where I discovered through failure to reverse conditions, 
in mainstream medicine, but actually finding um, methods that work to reverse conditions, including skin conditions, including, you know, I didn't used to tolerate foods like wheat and dairy. I, I still try and stay away from them and not consume them too much, but because um, I just don't think that they're the best for my body or most people's bodies. But, you know, I tolerate them now and things like that. These are things that are unheard of within the um mainstream medical community i've been speaking on the phone to people who have reversed crohn's disease which they say that there's no they don't understand the cause for in mainstream medicine and they can't cure i've spoken to people who've reversed cancer through um researching this book which again they can't explain or account for in mainstream medicine and they say that the protocol the treatment protocols that these people have spoken on the phone to have used are baloney well, explain how they've got before and after x-rays showing that they reversed their conditions. So because of I was coming forth from a lot of different backgrounds, let's say, like my interest in kind of like the economics of healthcare, as well as good science and medicine from like the COVID thing, like just wanting to restore the world to reason and say, look, before you go treating something, let's, you know, Let's diagnose what's causing the thing, you know, or what's making you susceptible to it. I mean, wouldn't you be interested in at least as many people surviving should they get sick as possible? And um, so these are things that for some reason, make your own judgment at home, we're not part of the mainstream discourse. So that as well as my own health issues, I, I guess at some point I started pulling material from my other projects that, and I had an, a vision for this which I thought would take a lot less time than it has but I, I'm not bored, trust me I learn interesting things about pharma every single day working on this and um, there's so much to learn um, I just, once I started working on this, I just woke up every day and I knew what I was doing on the planet, I was like Given my personal combination of skills and experiences, I just knew that if I was going to be useful in the world, this is the most useful thing I could do. I should also add to that, you know, economists and philosophers and people who write about science, uh, science, science journalists are not exactly known for their notable, accessible style, but I am... Um, Start when I started as a writer, I was a theatre critic. I reviewed about 150 plays, musicals, operas, dance, all of that stuff, all performance, improv, and I, I edited reviews for other people. So from that, I learned a punchy conversational style, and I've tried to bring that to everything I do. And I think at this stage in history, where everyone's got a one-minute attention span from TikTok, having a punchy style is like really, really helpful and is needed. So I want to, in a way, demonstrate that you can write about high-level topics with evidence, with good science, with research, with, you know, good, well-reasoned arguments and still do it in a way that's punchy and fun to the reader. So that's how I got into it. Um, and... I guess um, af um, after your own comments, we can talk a little bit about some of the most outrageous things I've learned along the way. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. And I, I agree with your writing style is this, your ebook is so easy to read and Thank it's you. enjoyable to read and it, it's, it's packed. I mean, it's mm. packed full of so much information, but it's not, it doesn't feel like heavy and difficult. It's, it's it's a super easy read and very understandable and you have all the links and everybody can fact check it. So mm. writing that. Yeah. Yeah. And that short ebook that you can get at sevenpharmamyths.com, like I try to do that. One is like start with the most shocking material so that people go, wait, wait, what? And I would find this material on like page 157 of other people's books, you know, buried in there somewhere and be like, wait, what? What did you just say? And, and I thought, well, if I'm going to, let's just put all of that information up front. Let's put the most shocking information right at the beginning of the book, not, not hide it uh, on page 157. And then, you know, I try and play 
play with the style and have jokes in there and not be too serious. And, you know, my sense of excessive outrage that comes through the book, I think, is quite humorous and relatable. Um, although it may sound a little bit like I'm tooting my own horn, I just put it this way. I try and write about things in the way that I'd really love someone to write about them for me. So I do, do hope people will download it and let me know what they think. That's a great point with, um, you know, the, the shock, you know, putting the, the really crucial shocking things first, because in my work with Epic Times, I'm a health and wellness journalist, I read a lot of studies and trials, and you'll get through like all this mm-hmm. arduous and you'll get like, towards the bottom of all these pages and pages, and all of a sudden, there'll be like, three sentences in there, you're like, wait, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, 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 exactly. Finding, and you're like, it's buried. It's like buried in all this data. Well, you're you're a lot more tolerant than I am because uh, I uh, I'm shamelessly avoidant of reading studies and trials. What I like to think of my role as as I popularize the popularizers. So I take um, information from really great um, journalists in these fields, and I'm like, okay. I don't know if I'm more smart than any of these people. I seriously doubt that I am. I do. I wouldn't even know where to, how to go about reading a clinical trial and let alone conducting one. But what I do know is, like, I can write nice and simple. So if I can uh, distill, uh, distill information from people smarter than me and make it really chatty, then I'm like super happy with 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 that role. You know, the, the, bringing the jigsaw pieces together. Would you like me to start on some of the most shocking material that I learned? Uh, in your own health journey, you're talking about. Oh, well, I mean, just researching this book. Oh, yeah. Let's get into that. And and I want to start with history because I think mm-hmm. that's a good place to start um, with big pharma because it's so important right now. We don't mm-hmm. think about history. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I want to bring us up to date real quick, a little, little, little recap, and then we'll kind of get into some of these crazy details. Um, mm-hmm. But Big Pharma, as we all know, has been around for a little over 100 years. It started with Rockefeller when he took over the healthcare system, started peddling his petroleum-based pharmaceutical drugs, as well as Louis Pasteur's ideologies of the GM theory, which won political support over the terrain theory, which also supported Rockefeller's mm. sales pitch. And so began the healthcare business we're dealing with now in America. So that's kind of like a bit of a quick, quick, quickie. Mm-hmm. Of all that stuff. We have definitely been drinking out of the same cup, Christy. Like, <laughs> I fully endorse everything you've just said. Yeah. So in your book, you mention um, a study that was done in 2000. I thought this was really interesting in the Journal of Pediatrics and found there had been a 90% decline in all infectious disease mortality. And that was supported by the CDC statement that an average lifespan um, has lengthened 30 years since the 1900s. So what are the driving factors of this massive decline in mortality and lengthening of our lives in the study founding? Mm. Findings mm. Of how mm. did, has modern pharmaceuticals played a role in this? Has it been part all right. of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, the reason why we're living... 30 years longer is because of drugs, of course, right? I mean, that's what we all believe. I mean, let's, let's face it, you know, if you're depressed, it must be because you have a Prozac deficiency. That must be what's causing the depression. What I've really loved doing in this book is using the system's own sources against it. So most people think that the reason why we're living longer and healthier, and I've heard this for years, and I didn't actually really true I, I just remember people saying well you know we're living so much longer now and they always attribute to this to pharmaceutical medicine that's an interesting thing because not according to official sources the cdc said that 25 out of the 30 years that we've gained in lifespan are attributed attributable to advances in public health the pediatric study that you mentioned um, says that the 90%, a 90% decline in all infectious disease mortality was down to improvements in sanitary conditions 
and nutrition rather than medical treatments. So it's not because of it's not because of pharmaceutical science. That's for sure. I mean, certainly, if you uh, lose a limb, they stitch you up pretty good. I mean, if you when it comes to emergency medicine, if you need a skin graft, if um, you need you know something removed from your body, they're miracle workers, and they certainly can serve lives, save lives. But there's precious little data to suggest that having access to drugs makes people live longer. In fact, with the ex- I think you know if we could maybe save some of these drugs, um, well, some of the medical treatments like insulin and um, well, hormones for people who've had um, organs removed and things like that, putting things like that aside, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, if we had a like 10 year moratorium on drugs and no one could get any, I'm sure there would be some um, percentage of people who are a lot worse off because of that. But I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be surprised if more people were better off because of that. A lot of the drugs that people take are unnecessary. I've spoken to doctors who were in the mainstream system on six, seven, eight, nine, ten drugs, who said to their doctor, I felt so bad, I just wanted to die. So I stopped taking my drugs. And what did they know? They started getting better when they stopped taking their drugs. Now, obviously, we can't advise that anyone do, do that without consulting their medical professional. But let's just look at some of, as you said, the history, the historical conditions we're coming from. People don't appreciate that in the 19th century, people were crammed into tiny spaces. The, the, it was the midst of the Industrial Revolution. The air was full of smoke. Um, the, they didn't have indoor toilets that flushed. People would ride horses, horse-drawn carts through the street and the horses would poop on the street. So people were breathing all of this in. Even as early as the 1950s, half of people didn't have a washing machine or a refrigerator or central heating. Um, and one, one story that I love to tell is that um, in the 1800s, New Jersey was basically a swamp. And every summer, the mosquitoes would come over, bringing with them malaria and dengue fever and um People would just die of diseases in New York in the in the summer, but not rich people, of course, because they would just move somewhere where the climate was more favorable and they'd spare themselves and from that disease. Now it's 2023, and being poor is still hazardous to your health. And um, people in low incomes are more susceptible to diabetes and um, all sorts of all sorts of diseases. And because they can't afford their he- own health care, a lot of that's paid for out of the public purse. So it's not like those of us who have got a reasonable degree of um, comfort and affluence in life can afford to ignore it. Everyone's, we're all swimming in the same swimming pool. Now, the way that they stopped the New Yorkers from getting um, malaria and dengue fever was not to load them up with pharmaceuticals. They drained the swamp, literally. Over time, as society grew more affluent, um, New Jersey was no longer a swamp and there was no longer mosquitoes going over infecting people. Similarly, the housing improved. We got clean water through the faucets. In fact, clean drinking water was responsible for nearly half of the total mortality reduction in the 20th century. And nearly two thirds of the child mortality reduction, according to a study that appeared in Demo. Demo- Demography. Try saying that six times quickly in February two thousand and five. Wow. And 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 the water thing and and the fluoride didn't get put into the water. Mm. Until, I think the what fifties was it or six fifties or six. I'm just I just read an article. Mm. That's an interesting point. We are in under assault by so many chemicals today, which is what including pharmaceutical drugs, which is one of the reasons why. Life expectancy has also been actually declining since around 2013, 2014. And there's been a sharp decline in life expectancy over the last year or two, not in 2020 when COVID hit, but, you know, in 2021 and 2022, there was a sharp decline in um, the life expectancy during that year and uh, yeah, I can only imagine what was maybe introduced in 2021 
that might have led to people dying off a lot earlier. Hmm. I wonder what that could have been. Well, speaking of that, um, mm-hmm. wondering, let's talk about the polio epidemic and the polio vaccines, because this is something actually in 2020, I found um, there was uh, this incredible gentleman wrote a whole history of vaccines and I read mm. the vaccines and it was very shocking. And um, now, so the polio epidemic happened in the forties and fifties here in the U S and To this day, the CDC says that it was the polio vaccines that were responsible Mm. for the drop in polio cases. So based on your research, was it in fact the pharmaceutical drugs and vaccines that were responsible for eradicating polio? Well, it's quite interesting that they would claim that because by the 1950s, when the first oral vaccine was made available, the rates of polio in the US had already declined. In fact, they'd actually declined worldwide, um, even in countries where they didn't, they couldn't afford vaccines. By the time that the Salk vaccine was introduced in 1955, not that many people were dying of polio anymore. And in fact, it's even sometimes alleged that when people have received the, va- the polio vaccine and they get the symptoms that we used to call polio, they're just diagnosed with something else. Whereas if they hadn't had the vaccine, the doctors would be saying, well, you've got polio. And this is the thing with the with the way that, that, that we diagnose disease today based on symptoms. Um, you can have a bunch of causes for the same symptoms. Um, if you go on the internet and check, mm, no, I don't like to make statements I can't substantiate, so I'm trying to remember what um, news outlet reported on this. Um, Let me see if I can just do a quick search. Um, hmm. I know that it was reported several times that that more cases of polio are caused today by the oral polio vaccine that in the third world than the than the than the than the um, natural disease itself. Um, unfor- unfortunately, I can't recall what news outlet reported on this, but it was a mainstream news outlet, and they did publish three or four different articles about it. I was pretty amazed that 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 even appeared. Now, if you go to the book. Vaccination is not immunization by Dr. Tim O'Shea. Um, you'll get a lot of more, even more shocking um, information still on the host, uh, on the history of polio vaccines, which I'm not really putting in my book or anything like that because I don't really have the ability to go and follow up his statements and and check them for myself. But he puts a pretty um, convincing case forward. You'll find that over that period, whole numbers of diseases disappeared, um, including scurvy, rickets, and cholera that had no mainstream medical treatments. All, all, all infectious diseases, um, all communicable diseases fell um, in levels of incidence during that period, whether there was a vaccine for them or not. And they fell in countries even when there was a vaccine, they fell in countries that um, couldn't afford the vaccine. So um, it looks like it was things like rising um, living standards and herd immunity that was responsible for the declines in these diseases rather than the polio vaccine. That's really the terrain theory. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and really terrain theory should be called terrain theories because there's a lot of interrelated theories that range from, you know, on one extreme, viruses don't even exist to sort of in another extreme, which is, yeah, sure, you know, viruses and bacteria exist, but you need to invite them into your body by eating the wrong food or, you know, having toxins in there, you know, they're not, uh, bacterial infections are not the cause of your illness, some say, but they're there because of your, because of your illness. You know, if you have fungal infections and things like that, that those, those um, organisms need food to eat. They're feeding, they're feeding on your excess metabolic waste, which is why 
I've um, experienced symptom reversal from detox protocols. You take away the fungus, the food for you take away the food from the fungus, the fungus dies off. So by taking care of our the the terrain of our body, um, you know, we um immunize <laughs> ourselves <laughs> in a manner of speaking to infection. If you find that link, we'll post it below um, in the show notes as well, just FYI. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, defi- like I'll definitely look at it. Like it's a socioeconomic illness. Part of the you know, issue with illness can be a socioeconomic thing from what you're saying. Oh, yeah. Poor yeah, living to- standards. Totally. I mean, the, uh, in the I'm, I'm currently working on an expanded version of the seven pharma myths book for paperback because it's going to take me a long time to write the big book on big pharma and i'd really like something that people could hold in their hands while i'm working on it so that'll be about 120 120 pages nice little booklet people will be able to buy 10 copies and give them to their doctors and their aunt and whoever they want um but in that, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, the socioeconomic factors, because we're led to believe that the, maybe not your audience, but that, you know, the benevolent governments, what we, what we really, what you really need in America is socialized medicine like we have in Scotland, God bless us, because the government's going to pay for all your treatments and then people won't go bankrupt. Um, but what, I fear from social, I mean, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't wish America's um, healthcare system on anyone. I know a lot of people that healthcare is the main source of bankruptcy and you pay maybe twice per head what we do in most of Europe on healthcare, half of it's government spending. I'm not, this is the economics geek coming out. I'm not um, endorsing America's system. In fact, if you want a mainstream medical system, just have a look at Singapore's system again it's not perfect but they have a similar they have similar income and standard of living to america and yet they spend a quarter per head of what america spends on healthcare to live six years longer and have a much lower instance of disease so if there's any model for america to adopt it's not socialized healthcare like in the uk or germany it's like singapore's model in fact singapore's healthcare system was designed by american economists trying to fix america's system it's just that no one picked up their policies in america but the singapore the government of singapore went hmm that sounds like a pretty good idea let's do that so that could be a whole nother show um, but about the socioeconomic thing and why I'm talking about socialized medicine is there's that once you get this idea in your head that healthcare equals better health outcomes, the the path is clear. More is always better. Let's just spend more money. Let's just spend. Well, here, get this. America, the government spends as much. The American government spends as much per head on health care as the UK does. And we have socialized medicine and you don't. And on top of that, you pay the same again through your insurance. So they're spending twice as much as health on health care. Right. And you're all getting sicker and sicker. And so are we. Fair when we say they're spending, it's our taxpayer money. Right, exactly. <laughs> that we're they're working ste- hard for that we're yeah. yeah, they're stealing your money to pay for treatments that are not very effective and they're paying for expensive treatments where cheaper ones will do and 200 to 800 billion on unnecessary tests and more scandal. So more is not better. If they really cared about your health, they just take a small percentage of what they're spending on healthcare and go to the populations that are like the worst demographics and just like, see if they're living in houses with mold and like get them get rid of the mold and like maybe subsidize um adding minerals to the soil so that the produce that people have is high in mineral content the way that it used to be i'm not really in favor of government programs i'm just saying if you were i'm kind of like a little bit libertarian orientated as some people might guess but what i'm saying is if you were going to design a government program you could do one that would actually save money on the other end you know you'd save you'd spend the money preventing disease i mean 
According to one article, a heart attack could cost $760,000 when you take into consideration all of the health care um, then care at home, time off work, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, we couldn't spit, we couldn't take um, a tenth of that money and just basically bribe people to go to the gym and to eat some fruits and vegetables every day. Like, it would cost a fraction to just do something, to use it as crude a tool as bribing people as what it does cost to, say, administer chemo, which can run $250,000, you That's know, Many. Right, yeah, and it doesn't. It very rarely works. I mean, when you look at the the evidence, there's some cancers, maybe like lung cancer, that it might help some people with some of the time. But in the meantime, they were administering it to like all these cancers that later on they said, well, I mean, chemo doesn't really seem to work for that, and you wouldn't be surprised if they're continuing to do that. Plus, who's in charge of the data? Who funds the data? Um. And when you look again, how many, you know, Angel Angelina Jolie cut her breasts off. Now they very uh, to preemptively try and stop herself from gaining lung, from contracting lung cancer. Nowadays they very rarely um remove breasts, or at least they should, because the evidence say, um, okay. says <laughs> that just a lumpectomy is about as effective. Um, how you know what so how many how many treatments are they still administering that in five or ten years from now they're going to say oh sorry we were just butchering you all like Angelina Jolie that treatment is not very effective however we do have a new treatment for you and we know that it's effective because the same journal that told Angelo Lena Jolie that removing her breasts might stop her from getting cancer says that this new treatment's really effective. And in the book that you can get at sevenpharmamyths.com, I go through a whole list of treatments that were bought and paid for by your insurance, which you're forced to pay for, through your um through your employer whether you like it or not and you and your tax system you know they were shoveling public money into private hands to pay for it took me i think a whole page to list treatments that are no longer administered that the government used to pay for through the tax system whether you wanted to pay for them or not um so People like to think that's all in the past. I'll demonstrate to you if you download the ebook that it's not all that the, the incentives haven't changed one bit. The journals are still making money from selling copies of favorable articles back to drug companies. They're still getting advertising money from drug companies to advertise in their journal. It's a conflict of interest. A huge let me let me just get a statistic for you. Yeah, and that's what I found interesting in your book. You talk about, you know, we're all led to believe that pharmaceutical drugs are scientific and mm -hmm. trials and studies in these prestigious journals that say so. So of course they are and the doctors use those mm -hmm. to us. And in your ebook, you talk about how the bipartisan commission on comprehensive health care and the Institute of Medicine and the British Medical Journal all did a deep dive review to answer the question. Are medical procedures and treatment scientific? What did mm, mm. say on that? Um, yeah, and, and hacking and procedures and treatments. One thing I'd mention is Forbes. Oh man, uh, I don't have the headline at the moment. Um, Forbes reported that seventy-five percent of the budget of the FDA department that's responsible for assessing drugs comes directly from the pharmaceutical industry and um, there the fda's official website says around 50 percent. so whether you believe the fda's official website or forbes what's 25 percent between friends uh, the point still stands the idea i'm i'm writing a i'm writing an article at the moment for terrainscience.com and my Substack. Um, which, by the way, I'll subscribe you to if you download my ebook. You can unsubscribe if you want, but you might like to stay subscribed to my Substack um, on evidence-based medicine. And it's one of my favorite. Like, I just the the chapter on 
bad science and medicine, which was going into the big pharma book, has got so long, not only do I need to exclude material from it, but I'm going to break it down into two chapters. One is like the history of bad science and medicine, and the second one is why it's called... Is, is, yeah, the first, the first one is called If It Quacks Like a Doc on, on treatments that um, proved to be unreliable in the past. It's kind of like the ghost of Christmas past. And the, the second one's called Trust the Science because I couldn't think of a better title for it than Trust the Science. I could talk about bad science and medicine all day and I probably will. And what are some of the what are some of the yeah. pretty tricks so, and pretty ways they can so, so all right okay yeah like. okay I was gonna I was okay we'll we'll, we'll do that quickly and then I, I I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um evidence based medicine um as well and and why just because they call it that doesn't mean that it is so yeah there's so many tricks that pharmacy one of the main tricks that pharmaceutical companies use to bias the data is just not registering studies like so they'll they, they, so there's a widespread problem with pharmaceuticals start companies starting studies and then if they don't turn out the results that they want they just stop them early and then they bury them and because there's no like big registry I mean, there was an instance, I think, where the European Union tried to create a registry of um, studies, and then they, instead of uploading them as PDFs where you could search, like a database, they got someone to scan them. So they were all images. And, no, and so, so the database was completely useful, if useless for the purposes of searching anything. I'm sure they did that by mistake. But so every like, yeah, every year, there are just like so many studies that just get buried. And then they select the studies that they want because they're favorable and submit those to the FDA, which is, of course, like our impartial protector. They can do lots of things. They can treat, the thing is, the, the pharmaceutical companies are not obliged to give all of the raw data to the FDA and the FDA doesn't, res in, doesn't insist that they do it. What's more, so the drug companies aren't so, um, transparent. What's more, the FDA does not like opening their decision-making progress to the scientific community and go, this is why we think this drug's safe and effective. Their attitude is, you should just trust us, we're the experts, right? And it, it's kind of obvious why they don't want open book, because they don't want the embarrassment of other scientists coming along and saying, hey, you didn't read the data properly and you've let this bad drug through the net. Or why are you taking 14 years to, um, to approve this good drug that is helping people in Europe, in America, when it's already been approved elsewhere based on good science? So what they can the one of some of the worst science I've seen is in psychiatric drugs. And in some instances, in, for antipsychotics, they took a group of people who were on the drug already and doing okay, and they take them off the drug, and then they randomize half of them into an active um, group, which they redrug with the drug and the other half into the placebo group, the half that are withdrawing from the drug. And then they say, well, people seem to do a lot better on the drug than off the drug. Well, no SHIT if you call your placebo group a bunch of people that are withdrawing. They can treat side effects and then claim that the rate of side effects was low. By the way, the journals could insist that the pharmaceutical companies do show them all the data but they don't, which is just more in, um, more evidence that they're colluding. That's the other thing I was going to ask. Can we trust mm -hmm. journals? Mm. That's a whole. That's a that's a whole teaching in itself. Mm. So uh, can we? Um, you know the the conflicts of interest that are going into journals and how many editors of journals have complained that they are um, that what passes for science in a lot of the journals is really just promotion of drugs, right? So. I've got a whole list. I've got a whole list of um, 
of 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 dirty tricks that pharma pharma can use to make good science, bad science look good in the book. Um, but the 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 movement for evidence based medicine um, really took off in the nineties, and that sounds great. I mean. If if I was to put a chemical in my body that was going to radically alter my my biochemistry, I'd want to know that it was based on good solid science. Solid science. But here's the thing: anyone at home a fan of Shakespeare? In Romeo and Juliet, he has Juliet say, "A rose by any other name would smell as sweet," and what she means is, you know, Romeo, her love is a Capulet. And why does it matter that his name is Capulet? Because he 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 would be the same person if he has a different name. Now I could go around calling a swan a, a a duck a swan, but that wouldn't give a duck a nice elegant long neck the way that a swan has. And you can call it evidence based medicine, but really what it should be called is authority based medicine. Because before we had the evidence, the move to evidence based medicine, doctors were meant to use their wits to read studies, understand the cause of disease, and then treat the disease according to its cause. Now you have evidence-based medicine, which means the authorities will tell doctors for this, subscribe, prescribe this, for this, prescribe that. These will start as recommendations and over time they will become the standard of care, which means that the doctor has been lobotomized and doesn't need to use his own brain. Um, and if he does say, well, you know, what I'm seeing with this drug is a lot of side effects in patients with your condition. So based on my own discernment, I'm going to, I'd suggest that you take this one that's got fewer side effects in my experience and in the experience of my colleagues. Well, that now goes against the standard of care. So he's going to have to risk being sued or having his job or his license to practice medicine taken away. Now, in a sense, I actually think that doctors should be able to trust authorities. I would love to live in a world where doctors didn't have to be scientists and read through studies every day, and they could just focus on, well, mostly diagnosis and recommending pro protocols based on the best evidence available. But once you have this system where the American Cancer Association makes recommendations for how to treat cancer, but is then um, funded by pharma, not to mention, uh, and they, they say nothing about diet because they, they take huge sums of money from, um, from junk food companies. They definitely don't say anything about um, wireless technology because they're getting huge sums of money from Microsoft and other companies that create um, so once you have the diabetes, uh, American Diabetes Association or whatever the authority is in diabetes, taking huge sums of money from insulin manufacturers or just putting people on their board that were previously employed by diabetes manufacturers, it's no wonder that they keep on recommending the most expensive up-to-date forms of insulin when older cheaper uh, human recombinant insulin is is cost a fraction you know and people are dying because of these guidelines because they're recommending expensive insulin when cheap insulin will do the same job same goes for um the american heart association and um, what happens is they go okay well everyone over 65 should take a satin no let's make it 63 no, let's make it 61. Hey, how about 57? I'll next, they're going to be telling you, do you know what? Fluoridation of the water was such a great success. We should just put statins in the water and that will lower every. It's coming. It's coming. You just keep your eyes peeled. Before long, the um, Amer American Heart Association will be telling you that children should be taking statins. So because they're getting myocarditis. Hmm. I wonder why they're getting myocarditis. So as soon as you have authority-based medicine, it's really simple. 
all you do is you, as a pharmaceutical company, you colonize the authorities, and um, and that's what is that's what's really happening when you when you hear evidence based medicine. What 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 you what what it really is is authority dictated medicine. It's terrifying, and you have a couple of quotes in your book that I found were pretty shocking when you say deans of medical schools often tell graduate doctors learning that half of what they learned in the past four years is wrong, but nobody knows which half. And also that doctors receive less than four hours of training in nutrition in the entire education program. Mm -hmm. And you also state that doctors are not legally allowed to prescribe anything but surgery and drugs anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this creates, cause I speak to, I consult with mainstream doctors, um, that I'm friends with that are sort of wise to what's going on. And because they give me an inside view and they help me understand a lot of it. And there, well, I mean, one thing you've come across a lot is when people manage treatments from outside the biomedical, the mainstream medical system, the best their doctors can say is, well, you know, look at their scans, like, well, keep on doing whatever you're doing, you know, and, and people who have reverse can't, because they, what, what, they don't want to know anything about it, because what are they meant to do with the information? You know, sometimes they just need to go off record, like some, what someone I was speaking to the other day um, said, his uh, doctor went off record with him when he, when, you know, he reversed Crohn's disease. You know, first he'd say things like, why are you getting better and my other patients aren't? And he'd say, well, you know, doctor, I'm not taking your poisonous meds. And they'd have a laugh. And he said, eventually he said, you know, Paul, like, I can see what you're doing. I fully support it. But I'm not allowed to recommend this to my other patients because I'm liable for it. So that's that's the thing. And um, another problem is, so many patients just love the authority of doctors. They just want to go to the doctor and tell the doctor their woes and they want pills. You know, I've got a friend that's a doctor that says, he's told people, I'm going to, I'll give you these pills. There's a good chance six months you're going to come back with erectile dysfunction. Oh no, I want the pills, I want the pills. Guess what? Six months later, they can't get it up. Okay, what do you want for that? Guess what they want for that? More drugs. Okay, well, these drugs are going to cause another side effect. He's promised to send me a chain. You know, this drug leads to this side effect, leads to this drug leads to this side effect. Or he said he could send me at least six of them for inclusion in, in the book. And, and what do the pharmaceuticals stand to lose from causing like another another word for a side effect is a disease right yes great point if you if you take a drug and it gives you erectile dysfunction well you just gave yourself another disease why don't we call them why do we call them side effects we should call them diseases anyway i'm i'm glad i'm glad i can speak to you guys <laughs> Absolutely. Restore my sanity. Sometimes I feel like yeah, so hopeless writing this book. Other times I feel really excited. Now, we were talking about the FDA and this whole pres the prescription or the process of getting drugs approved. And you mentioned in your book, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act was passed mm. in 1992. What did, what did that act do? Yeah, that, that, um, that um, attracted a lot of mainstream criticism because what that what the PADUFA, as it was known, allowed people to do was to the drug companies to do was to pay to expedite the regulatory process, um, and they, when the 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 reasoning behind it sounds reasonable. It's like, well, you know, it takes a lot of people to get the drug through, so why don't you like give us some money and we can employ some more people. But, you know, that creates a conflict of interest. One of my, um, uh, a writer I admire, I've spoken to her before, Mary Ruhr, wrote a book called Death by Regulation. And she said that actually the regulatory process went from four years to approve a drug to 14 years to approve a drug. And she would say, well, maybe we would be in support of this 
that that's why people were recommending something like Padufa, because it was taking so long to approve drugs. And, and people were arguing, well, people are going to die without these drugs. And so, so people wanted a way to get the drugs through faster. Now, Mary said, pointed out, well, look, if the drugs were safer, maybe we'd support a 14 years um review um 14 years to pass them but actually there was more drug withdrawals not less after lengthening the regulatory process so you could cynically say that stretching it out for 14 years what's the purpose of that well only really really rich drug companies can afford to put their treatments through you're definitely not going to get um a herbal medicine manufacturer that can afford the hundreds of millions or even billion, hundreds, who knows how many billions of dollars to go through that process. So in economics, we call this barriers to entry. You make it very difficult for people to enter the market. Stem cell research is a perfect example of this. People are going to Mexico, to Tijuana, to get stem cell treatments. Now, there was a doc who tried to set up in, I think it was California, um, to to get um, to get stem cell treatments for uh, approved, but the thing is, just to um, fill out the form, I think they were going to charge uh, millions and millions of dollars. And if one comma is in the wrong place, you have to pay the money and do it again. Then after that, you need to do stage one trials, which is going to cost. 100 to uh, sorry 40 to 150 million dollars just for the first stage of the trial and here's the thing you can't just say this is for stem cell treatments for everything this is for each condition 40 to 150 million for stage one trials for shoulder replacements then the same for hip replacements then knee replacements then arthritis Every condition, you're going to have to start the regulatory process all over again to get the treatment approved. Why? Is that because it's better for people to have to go to Mexico to get these treatments? No, it's because these treatments pose a serious threat to the huge amounts of money that pharmaceutical companies are making from treating things like arthritis, not very successfully, I'd add, and the huge num sums of money that private hospitals are making from replacing shoulders, hips, and knees. That is terrifying. So it's just a slippery slope. I mean, and that sounds like where the root cause of this, of our healthcare in America being so like expensively mm -hmm. out of proportion kind of starts. That's yeah. The and, and the approval process. And where is this money going to? I mean, <laughs> like, what are the mm -hmm. salaries of the people on the FDA? What, what, I mean, that's well, yeah, it's keeping a lot of um, scientists busy doing trivial things rather than looking at the big picture. Um, and it's a brain drain because science, because good scientists are, you know, very, very valuable. Um, so they could be doing other other research that wasn't so tedious. Um, but I mean. A small, if a small fraction of this money was being allocated to preventing disease, you'd get a lot more bang for your buck. I just fear that that's not on the agenda at the moment. Absolutely not. And speaking of the agenda, Pfizer has made a substantial amount of money in the last few years. What are some important things that we need to know about Pfizer that you found? In hmm, interesting. Pfizer were um, given the biggest fine ever for fraudulent science. I mean, the interesting thing is all of these companies are convicted felons, each and every one of them, right? And yet, <laughs> and yet, oh, I'm sure that was all in the past and they're not committing fraudulent research anymore, right? Well, that's um, what yeah, people think. Money to continue, right? The, yeah, the interesting thing is John Abramson, who wrote two really good books. The first one is Overdosed America, I think approximately 2005, 2008, and, and his new one, um, Sickening, How Big Pharma Broke American Healthcare, 2022. Following his first book, he was consulted by um, lawyers who said, love what you did in Overdosed America, we're suing Big Pharma, 
and we need you. So he's been an expert in litigation against um, companies like Pfizer. Unfortunately, suing companies is such a long process that it seems like he can only do he can only, he can only get them once every couple of years. Um, but he's he's served in enough trials that he could comment on the process in his new book, Sickening. Um, interesting, he was on a bunch of shows, and he writes in his book, he he was asked what Pfizer did that caused them to be um, be sued. The biggest, the biggest fine ever for fraudulent science. And he says, well, I know, but I'm not allowed to tell you. Because part of being involved in the court case was I was made to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And so the courts, here we have a instance of convicted felons defrauding scientific research and putting lives at risk by getting doctors to prescribe medications that harm patients. And the courts decided no one's allowed to know what they did wrong. I mean, what more do you need to know than that? This is what not... Year was this lawsuit? When did this happen? Um, let me see if I can find that information for you. It's in the updated... Um, this was the, the lawsuit was in America, if that's what you're asking. It was in America. Yeah, I was just wondering. Yeah, how yeah, yeah, it was. It, oh, it was recent. It was in the last couple of years, in the last few years. Um, but this is typical because the pharmaceutical companies are not obliged to submit all their data to the FDA. Sometimes no one will ever get hold of the data unless the drug causes so much harm conspicuously that they get sued and then the court forces them to open their books for the litigators to look at. Now, it could be that these drugs are causing lots of harm inconspicuously and it'll never come to light. In fact, during my research, I've come across instances where pharmaceutical companies were sued for illegally promoting drugs to doctors for conditions that they weren't approved for the treatment of. And they were sued, but what the court sued them for was a lot less than the profits that they made from those drugs. And because the court case didn't even make headlines, doctors don't even know any better, and they may still be continuing to prescribe those drugs out of habit for people for those conditions. Um, so it's, it's, the more you learn, the more you'll go mad. Thank you. Thankfully, the ebook book com is only 67 pages. So you won't go half as mad as I have gone. In your research. <laughs> yes, it's, it's packed full of things that you really need to know. And we're only mm. scratching the surface in this conversation, unfortunately. Um, let's get into some like kind of, you know, ideas around how we can shift this and take control of our own health. Before we do that, do you have anything else to add around any of these um, insane things that you've learned that are? Um, yeah. No, I, I feel like I've spoke rather a lot. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've kind of covered a lot of ground. Now, you know, as we said before, farmer school of medicine does not treat or eradicate disease. If it did, the numbers wouldn't be skyrocketing. Um, what's mainstream medical's ideology around health and wellness, and how do we need to shift that in order for us to find, you know, a better sense of health and wellness here in the United States? Well, I guess there's two ways you could look at it. One is your body is like hastily cobbled together by evolution and is just bound to break down as you get older like um you know like a second hand car does you know you just and true enough we are we're all on the road to the grave right but how gracefully you find your way to the grave is largely down to you and as I say, like, I try and back up everything I say as much as possible with official sources. The official sources agree with us 
that 70% of illness is lifestyle related. So even if you just take, I, I, I say it's probably quite a lot more than that, but let's just take them at face value. If that was true, you'd think that 70% of the money they spend on healthcare would go to preventing disease. 70% caused by lifestyle, well then maybe you should spend 70% on preventing it. And that's not on their agenda. There's another way to look at it. I'm not saying that they're mutually exclusive. There's probably, you could say that there's some amount of truth and some crossover, but essentially that the body's intelligent and it's always trying to um, reach homeostasis and compensate for your bad lifestyle choices. And it's an organism that has needs. If you don't water your houseplants, they will die. If you don't make sure that your plants in the garden have access to sunlight, good soil, etc. If you don't meet their needs, they're not going to thrive. You know, and the same goes for animals. And humans are just like animals, but a little bit more complicated. We maybe have more complicated social, psychological, emotional needs than they do in most of the animal kingdom. But essentially, we're an organ we are an organism just like your house plants or your cat and we have needs and when we don't meet the body's needs we suffer we fail to thrive so that's the most obvious thing your body needs a full complement of vitamins amino acids trace minerals etc then there's that's nutrition water most people are much more dehydrated than they think they are and uh, one of the reasons for that is all the dry food we're eating if you look at nature, with the exception of nuts and seeds, animals don't tend to eat things like corn chips and bread, things that going through your system will soak in the, soak out the water from your system like a sponge. When you eat high, con high water content foods, that would be fruits and vegetables, it's not just instantly absorbed through the stomach or the walls of the intestine, it goes all the way through the tube and therefore gives you, offers you a much deeper level of rehydration because your stool should be 75% water. Anything that you eat that's under 75% water is going to dehydrate you. These are examples of our basic physiological needs. And when you, so kind of in the terrain world, we say there's at least three major, probably three major causes of disease. One is deficiency. The second is toxicity. And I was talking about authority-based medicine before. And here's a here's a big example of the neglect of authority-based medicine. Because when you've got a company like an organization like the American Cancer Association, they completely ignore and disregard the link between toxicity and cancer. And I'm talking about things that there's stacks of studies to show the link. And that happens on multiple levels. I'm talking about toxins from the environment. Um, and then there's just your own, your body's own metabolic waste. Every cell needs to breathe, poop, eat, just like you do. And if your cells are pooping faster than you're cleaning the waste out, then you're body is going to degrade because you're swimming in your own waste. This is, if you look hard enough, you'll find plenty of information to support excess metabolic waste as causative in a lot of the diseases that we're um, suffering from today, as well as waste from the environment. So, uh, not waste, rather, toxins from the environment. This is something that the um, mainstream medical community seems to be ignoring. And third, um, well, emotional and psychological factors, including stress, you know, again, mainstream sources, stress is the biggest killer. The more you go into the biology of it, the more you see that systems that are essentially, that are essential to your, the good functioning of your body shut down when, or don't perform at the optimal level when you're psychological and emotional uh, well-being is not uh, at its best. So 
if we see our needs coming into these categories of avoiding deficiency, nutrition, water, sunlight, all of those things, um, avoiding toxicity and having a um, healthy relationship towards our emotional, psychological needs, I think by addressing those things, we'd find that we'd need a lot less medicine. I love that. And in his ebook, he has a very comprehensive list on specifics on how we can take back control of your own health. And I learned a lot from that. So thank you for doing all that research. It's really, um, it really simplifies everything and gets, it gets it down to the basics because it really is, you know, I mean, after you've done all the research, it's not that complicated. Mm-hmm. There's just so much complicated mm-hmm. information out there and so many, you know, unfortunately corporations and businesses involved that have financial interests that are making everything very complicated and right ruining our health we need to work very hard to simplify this information at this point in history and i kind of see myself as like a little bit of a funnel or like as well as a laboratory because i've experimented in my own body but yeah i'm, tr- I'm i appreciate the compliment because i'm really trying to do that simplify it to the most actionable steps and you know and um when you read it this way it it's it makes intuitive sense you can read that and go oh yeah you know that that um is sensible it, you, you know it, it, i can see why that would work so i've tried to make it as simple as possible and i, I appreciate your um acknowledging that we are an exceptional funnel and we're going to post mm-hmm. it below your ebook. And you also have a new book coming out, as you mentioned before, Big Pharma, None Dare Call It Quackery. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that when we can expect its release? Right. So that thank you for asking. Um, the truth is, I don't know when it's going to come out, but you, the, um, excerpts from it are constantly appearing on terrainscience.com. If you download my ebook sevenpharmamyths.com i will put you on my mailing list and you'll definitely get updated you'll you will not miss the book coming out before then i'm going to make an intermediate step where i'm going to um, release a paperback if you know maybe about the twice the length of this ebook so um i'm going to keep on putting things out and i just recommend people follow along because if you like what you hear you're going to continue liking what I'm putting out because this stuff never gets boring. I am like amazed at how much stuff that you you might think was a little bit geeky and uninteresting. Like why do we waste so much money on unnecessary tests? When you look into these like geeky subjects, it's just like they're so full of richness and there's just so everything is just so interesting. So uh, big pharma, none dare call it quackery. The reason for that is there is an old saying by John Harlington. Um, he said, treason doth never prosper. What is the reason? Why for, if for, why, for if it prosper, none dare call it treason. And what he meant was, well, I mean, if you're a pirate and you're convicted of treason for trying to overthrow the monarch, you know, you get throw, you get executed or thrown in the slammer. But if you sur- if you succeed in usurping the government, then it's not treasonous. You're just the new king. Similarly, the pharmaceutical industry is completely replete with treatments that would be called quack treatments if there were an alternative medicine. Thankfully, a podcast host corrected me and said I should stop calling it alternative medicine and start calling it something like traditional medicine because calling it alternative is accepting the mainstream narrative and what is and what isn't medicine. Now, I'm perfectly willing to accept that there's lots of quack treatments in the alternative world as well, but we hear all about that from Michael Shermer and Sam Harris and all these so-called skeptics, right? Mainstream medicine is replete with treatments that should be considered quackery, but they've taken over the system. So they decide for themselves what the definition of quackery is. And 
whenever it's a mainstream treatment, oh, that's just the kind of mistake that slips through the net from time to time. It's not quackery. Well, I insist that we should dare, we should dare to call it quackery. Um, you know, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then it's a freaking duck. So, um, so um, quack, quack is all I've got to say. <laughs> now, you've mentioned terrainscience.com, which highly recommend everybody go over there and check out his journalistic work. It's incredible. And they have so many really incredible groundbreaking articles on there. And his ebook, we're going to post that below. Um, we're looking forward for, you know, to when your next book comes out. Mm -hmm. Is there any, for those that want to contact you, or are there any other resources or additional uh, ways? Oh, yeah. I should mention, um, you mentioned at the beginning, this is my side like writing about this stuff is my side hustle um you mentioned that i'm a psychotherapist and um, if people are interested in that sort of thing they can go to be yourself and love it.com if they think i might be a good match for them i was 80 percent online even before the pandemic so moving to 100 percent online wasn't that much of a um change for me um contact yeah i mean you will find means of contacting me through these websites be yourself and love it.com seven pharmamyths.com terrain science.com or you can just look anthony samaroff up on social media i'm not difficult to find out there on the internet land and i would love to hear from you beautiful thank you for sharing that we will post links to all of his um, pages etc below and thank you anthony so much for joining me today this was a, such a great conversation and you've done some really deep quality research around mm. and all these these issues i mean it's just such a massive like machine full of all these problems that's happening we need to sort it out and you're you're really helping with that um and your ebook is so com comprehensive and i really enjoyed that before we wrap it up do you have any final thoughts to share yeah, I'd just like to thank you so much for being such a gracious podcast host. I was really looking forward to us getting the chance to have this conversation. And um, I feel like you really helped me get a lot of information out in a very short space um, of time. So it's just really great to join you, Christy. And thanks so much for having me on your show. Thank you. And there was so much more I want to talk about when you were at time. I was like, oh. I'm sure we I'm sure we will another time. I'm sure I'm, if you'd be kind enough to have me back when this uh, paperback is going to hit, then I'd love I'd love to I'd love to speak to you again. Love to have you back. There's just so much more to talk about. Remember, knowledge is power. The more you understand about your body, the better you're able to stay healthy and prevent disease. And if you like this video, please like and share with others. This, from, if this information could really help somebody know if you haven't already hit the subscribe button to be sure you don't miss out on our future shows. And I will see you all next Wednesday on the next episode of Discovering True Health. Mm -hmm.